With friendly hellos and welcome to the first allocator call taking place on July 23rd. Let's take a look at the agenda for this session. We're going to spend the majority of this call on four main points. The first is a quick recap. Most of the team was at the Built Dev Summit taking place in Brussels. So we're going to walk through what are some of the session highlights that came from those talks and make sure that everyone has links to some of the sessions that were most applicable to allocator issues. Second, we'll check in on the data cap for refresh. So these are the allocators that have already distributed all or most of their five petabytes, and they're up for review for how their diligence took place and if they're receiving additional data cap. So we'll be closing that loop out for the 12 applications that have filed and submitted, and then open ourselves up for the next step, which is applications for new allocators to come on board. So we'll talk about the RFA and what we're looking for in new allocators. We'll take a look at the timelines, what you could expect if you reapply as an allocator coming back. And the third part of the conversation today is on open data sets. We'll talk about common crawl and how many data sets actually add value to the network and how many data sets reach a certain point where there's no longer value determined. So we'll kind of have a conversation around this, looking for a lot of feedback from you on these topics. So with that, let's take a quick look at just the timelines. Today is the 23rd. There'll be an additional call taking place at 1900 Pacific, 0200 UTC, and the next call will take place on August 6th. If you take a look at our metrics month over month, we see continual growth in this program as we start to onboard this data. So 29 clients newly served over the last 30 days, which resulted in 54 petabytes dispersed. Over four new allocators have onboarded their pathways and have started making that deal distribution. So thank you. Good job. Here to help as you go forward. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the build this. See that we have Galen on the line. Galen, if it's okay, I'll kind of turn the floor over to you to kind of give us a session highlight, or I'll be happy to fill in from my standpoint here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kay Ray. Um, so this was uh, Dev Summit number four in Brussels um, alongside uh, Phil Brussels and ETCC. Um, a lot of good sessions. We did things a little differently this time. Instead of doing a dedicated Phil Plus track, we sort of joined um, some of the other tracks that were already going um, and led different talks in some of those other tracks. A couple different sort of highlights came out of this, some, some good brainstorming and conversation. Um, some of the session highlights here you can see one of the ones from the session that i was leading so i'll i'll speak to it most um we were talking about you know different on-chain subsidy mechanisms you know if, if we know that the network wants to incentivize uh, deal making and data onboarding right now we have that one kind of on-chain mechanism which is that 10x multiplier and so what could be some other types of on-chain subsidies uh, so we discussed different you know ones that have existed in the past such as sector duration multiplier that was a different example um Julian we're getting some background noise so I'm gonna go ahead and mute you sorry um sorry about that uh Julian if you had something feel free to to unmute and, and chime in. Um, uh, so we were talking about different types of on-chain subsidies. And one of the things that really came out of this conversation is there are lots of different ways that we could structure it. We could have, you know, a different on-chain subsidy connected to deal pricing. We could have on-chain subsidies connected to, you know, some kind of retroactive uh, retrievability score where the subsidy might start very low, but as that data is demonstrated to be retrievable, the subsidy could increase over the life of that deal. There could be lots of ways that we could design this, but one of the things that we're missing is a way to test and experiment with those subsidy systems um, because a lot of people have a lot of great ideas but then it leads to a lot of kind of discussion and speculation around, well, how would it work? What would the buy-in be? What would the you know, outcomes be? And so one of the things that came out of this brainstorming session that, that I would love if there are people on the call or listening to the recording that might have some experience with this or some ability to help us kind of prototype it, is there was this idea of using sort of a parallel test net where we could take a snapshot of the actual chain, stand up a test net that would run for a certain amount of time with some of these different 
you know, on-chain parameter rules as a way to experiment with, you know, what would actually happen if we say uh, added a different type of data cap. So instead of the 10x QAP, what if there was a different second type of subsidy? Um, so that is interesting to me because, you know, we've heard a lot of conversations back and forth over the past like two years around both, you know, the off-chain rules of the program um, and what works and what doesn't, as well as sort of just the realities of the on-chain rules of the program only having this one 10x multiplier and so i think there's a lot of um, arguments and, and justifiable cases to be made for having multiple different types of subsidies but the thing that we need to do is figure out a way to test those and experiment with them so if you have ideas we'd love to hear about them we'd love to see some proposals for ways to test and experiment um, and kind of gather some real world insights and information into what works uh, and what doesn't. Other session highlights, um, we had some different kind of design sessions and, and working sessions around what are ways we can automate more due diligence, what are ways we can automate compliance reports, how do we expand on the due diligence. Um, I'm, we successfully open sourced uh, the data cap stats tool. Um, so we're seeing requests for features uh, there in that data cap stats um, dashboard repo. And there was a lot of talk around what is happening with client business development. Who is working on this? What needs to be done? Um, so that was another place where there's some kind of new working groups that are being stood up around product market fit and uh you know how do we attract other clients at different scales to the filecoin network so overall very successful dev summit um Kara, if you want to click to the next slide please uh there's links here Kara already dropped links to this slide deck um, in our chat uh, and there are links to some of these different sessions. There were a lot of talks just at the Dev Summit alone, as well as lots of parallel events. Um, so great times. Um, thanks for thanks for the time on that. The next big event that I know about will be, I think, in November, um, Phil Bangkok. There are probably multiple other events between now and then um, with some Orbit events or you know, smaller uh, events that we go to, but it's the next big one that's on my radar where we'll have um, another kind of big showing from the Phil Plus uh, team would be that one in November. So that's it for the Dev Summit updates. I'll pass it back to you, I think. Let me see what the next slide is actually. All right, maybe I started off and then I'll hand it back to you, Galen, for any kind of Sounds thoughts good. on the data cap. All right, so let's take a look at the data cap refresh. So we had 81 allocators that were onboarded. They were all received five petabytes of data, whether you're running a meta pathway that was manual or automatic. And now after the last couple of months, we've seen 28 of those organizations use up the majority of their five petabytes. So seven of those have been refreshed as is. Great job, keep up the good work. Five were conditionally approved, which said, hey, we see a lot of potential. As you start getting going, modify these things. And so they received a smaller amount to kind of make those modifications. And four were denied outright, either lack of diligence, lack of retrieval, lack of transparency with the storage providers. And 12 have been in review. I'd like to start by saying thank you to those organizations in review. One of the reasons why this first time took a lot longer than it will going forward automated wise is setting up a lot of these processes so that there was a fair and standardized way to look at a lot of very different applications. So what we have now is those 12 applications have all been reviewed. You will start to see those posts in the GitHub repository shortly with the root key holder allocating that. If you were an organization that was told, hey, we're going to partially refill Please be very mindful to address the points, whether it's keeping diligence in your bookkeeping, whether it's making sure that it's Spark retrievable. Please, 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 please list that in the review and then we can get back and make this much faster as we go forward as we start to see those coming back. 
So with this, these are the organizations right now that are finishing up their reviews and we'll have these posted. So 1475, EF, Genesis, Non-Entropy, ByteBase, VSTAR, and Alpha and D Labs, MetaERA, Data Preservation, Fiddle, Hatch Team, and Huon Network. So you will see these come through. Again, it should be no real mystery. The big areas that we're looking at are these four. Can we see your bookkeeping in KYC with your clients? Do the SP deal making distributions hold to what you said would happen and what would happen? Was the distribution schedule in line with what you said would happen as far as a tranche schedule or was it just all at once? And then was that data cap retrievable or was that data retrievable? So this is what we're looking for. This is what we're posting in the comments and this is what we're looking for feedback on. I'd like to turn over to Galen who can provide any kind of like additional thoughts on this or kind of next steps. Yeah, I think uh, I think you really hit it on the head. Um, this is a you know newer process for us um, in this round. Um, there are like we've been saying from the beginning, the whole goal of this allocator process was to allow teams to design and build their own pathway uh, to understand how they will determine if a behavior is in scope. Meaning, is it a real client with real data doing real distributed deal making? And each pathway had different guidelines. Um, that leads to just a lot of different rules, a lot of different bookkeeping repos, a lot of different communications. Um, and then, so when we do these kind of audits, it takes a long time. I mean, we're look, we're trying to look through lots of evidence and refer back to the applications that were put in to see does this match um what you claimed to do as an allocator and what is our threshold for getting it wrong and so that's where we're trying to verify lots of information um looking at you know how much did you question the clients that were coming in uh, did you ask all of the questions you said you would? Did you keep that in the public bookkeeping repo that you said you would? Do your allocations match? And we understand that there is a, you know, there are lagging uh, behaviors and lagging indicators, right? Where you may, as an allocator, you may give that data cap to a client and then it's on the client to go do those deals and then it's on that SP to successfully onboard those and make those successfully retrievable. Um, so we understand part of this is outside of your control, but that is also the parts that are outside our control. So again, it is about where can we, the governance team apply leverage? Where can you, the allocator apply leverage? Where can the clients apply leverage? So if you said that the data needed to be public, open and retrievable, and you worked with a client who said that it would be public, open, and retrievable, but they work with an SP and that data is not public, open, and retrievable by the met methods that we have currently to test it, then someone isn't upholding their end of the bargain. And that's where we want to see these interventions. If you work with a client and that client works with SPs that don't meet your standards, do you continue to work with that client or do you cut that client off or do you say to that client, you're not upholding our end of the bargain. This is not what we agreed to. You need to go find other SPs. Here are some examples. So what is that back and forth communication? Where is it happening? And again, if this is happening in you know, all different platforms, it makes it really hard for us to audit because now we have to go try and chase it down and people are trying to provide evidence to us and say, oh, here's where I captured this. Go read through this. You know, it's, it is a problem of manpower and it is currently a very manual process. Um, and there are ways that we are trying to change that uh, to make it faster. But as it is, it just takes a lot of time to go through these. We are getting um, better at them and understanding kind of what can we turn into a report and a template? Um, you, how can we add things to the CID checker? Uh, how can we add things to, you know, build other bots that we need to help us comb through these faster? Um, but also, how can we get the allocators to help us? If you want your audit and your diligence review to go faster, make the information easy for us to track down. 
Um, if you don't have anything in your public bookkeeping repo, then it's going to look like there's no diligence. So if, if you provide all of that information in a consistent place where we can find it, that's going to make our job easier and it's going to make this review happen faster. And you're going to be happier with the results. The community is going to be happier with the results. So that's our priority um, for this week is to get through these next, uh, I believe it was 12 different um, ones that are still in review, um, sending those requests up to the root key holders uh, and seeing the root key holders take action on those um, kind of this week and in the next two weeks. So data cap refresh to allocators is an ongoing thing and we're excited to, to kind of keep doing it a little bit better and faster as we, as we practice it. Back to you. Thanks, Galen. So question from Josh in chat. So you should see that refresh come in, provided that you were in the group that's receiving it by end of week. What we're doing right now is we're posting it. We're going to give each allocator a chance to look at it. If it's approved as is, and then we're just waiting on the group key holders. If there's any additional information needed, that'll be up to the allocators. So if you were in that as is, you should see that go out this week. And we'll get back to you. Feel free, as always, to respond to the issue or in the allocator panel we have in Slack. All right. Next topic is anybody who submitted an application to become an allocator. So as a quick check-in, Fiddle put together a guide on how to apply, which is a combination of filling out a form in GitHub, which will create an issue. Then you can submit all your diligence in Airtable, which pushes it back. I want to kind of highlight this for two reasons. If you were an organization that, for whatever reason, did not receive a refresh on your data cap, it's because the steps that were taken did not conform with the program guidelines. You were very welcome to reapply. One of the points that I would say on reapplying, though, is that from a priority standpoint, we are de-scoping the manual applications versus the pathways which are automated. So what this means is that if you were an allocator, you did not receive a data cap refresh, you were very much encouraged and welcome to submit another application and come back. But the highlights will be a much slower turnaround time on processing the application, getting the data cap, and it will come in a much smaller amount. And that's by design to make sure that those allocators that are performing as they said they would receive the first service line from the bandwidth on the governments and allocators that wish to reapply and retry will be at the bottom of that list. So I wanted to make sure that everyone was tracking. There will be a delay, a very sizable delay for allocators that are applying under a strict manual process. And the reason for that is if you look at this slide on the screen now, we have 47 active manual allocators, which is great. It means that if any applicant is looking for an allocator, they have 47 that are spread across the entire world, all time zones, all backgrounds. So we're really looking for something new if someone wants to join that list of manual allocators. But the RFA was put out for people that are building automated pathways like GitHub, WeChat, or socials, or a market-based. So if you are building an allocator on those pathways, we will prioritize that due to the RFA. Everything else that's manual will be de-scoped and onboarded as bandwidth allows. So I'll kind of pause, see if Galen has thoughts or anybody has thoughts and questions. Yeah, you covered it. There, there are questions in the application asking uh, what, what type of pathway are you building? How are you expanding on what already exists? Um, a lot of the applications that we're seeing are uh, very similar and you know, would be kind of duplicates or redundant and clients that would apply to those uh, could very easily apply to the existing active manual uh, allocators. There's private data, there's public data, there's, you know, more distributed, there's less distributed, there's a lot that are there giving out data cap, they have already stood up their, their process. And so it's just not the highest priority for us right now to continue to onboard um, and invest in more of these teams. We, we have seen how long it takes for those teams to get up and running. Um, and since there are already teams that are doing it, we are going to encourage clients to go to those pathways. 
um, allocators to work with those in parallel and go read the request for allocators. Go look at some of these different options. Um, go experiment and be that new, novel, unique pathway. Outstanding. All right. Hey, the last topic we wanted to check in with before we kind of kick the proposal. So very much looking for feedback and thoughts and comments. What we're noticing is a spike in the duplication of open source data sets, you know, like common crawl type data that might be available. And while it's really helpful to have duplication of that data on the network, what we're finding is having 20 copies of the same data set in the same region really doesn't add a lot of value to those that might be trying to build on that data set or do something forward. So we're taking feedback now before having an official proposal and discussion to look at how we can kind of solve and address this. So one of the questions that can be asked is, if you are storing this open data set, is there already a retrievable copy of that data set? Kind of looking at if there's more than 10, it starts to get to like a range of like, great, what is the value of this? So not now, but soon, we will start looking at like how we can pull this up. So we're not just storing the same copies of the same data sets over and over again. So if you were preparing that and you see that there's more, more than 10 copies, be ready to answer like, hey, if we are onboarding this data set, what additional value comes from having this? So we'll be looking at tooling. We'll be having a proposal in the coming days and weeks to kind of discuss this and get your input on, on the thoughts on how to implement this. But we are noticing a sharp uptick in those common data sets that are coming. So love to get any feedback before we start to draft a proposal on how to make this better for everyone involved. All right. Before I open the floor up, we have two DMs, direct messages that have come through chat. One comes from Josh over at Non-Entropy Tech. And he said, uh, discuss with the Phil watchdog. It's quite difficult for allocators to find out which of the copies of the data sets are active and retrievable. That's a good flag, Josh. What I might do is put you in touch with Will Scott, works on the fiddle team, great guy. And he's been looking at this with Patrick Woodhead about how do we actually get that retrievable data set? How do you verify that? And how do you push it back? So rather than me giving you a generalized approach, I'm going to link in the subject matter expert. And if it's okay with you, Josh, I'm going to do this in our public Slack so that we can kind of have a more comms on that. I know that Galen probably has thoughts, so I'll turn it over to Galen before I move. Yeah, and similarly, this is a place where we would love community support what does it look like for us to have a you know json file a running list in a repo a uh you know something that goes on data cap stats where we could say let's tag these public open data sets in a certain way and then they'll populate on that list or that repo or that registry and say great like here are here are the copies from client applications that claimed i'm a client and i am uploading this public data set of common crawl and this is how i prepared it and then we can connect that to all those deals and sps that that client is making and then we can cross reference that i mean we have the cid checker let's have that work somehow in our favor to also connect it to what these data sets from the clients claim to be. And maybe it's not perfect or perfectly accurate, but it would be a first step in consolidating that information. So how do we get you know, the allocators to work with us or to help us build some kind of a standard where when a client is applying for a public open data set, you know, they're indicating what it is and we're tracking, hey, we've already got these other clients that have indicated they're onboarding that data set and here's the retrievability here's the distribution score of that public data set um you know that could be an entire bot separate uh and parallel to the cad tracker right it could be the public data set bot and it crawls across all of the bookkeeping repos and the on-chain data and 
then people could write better standards for how they index their data to say, you know, I, yes, this data set already exists, but I'm doing a better job of preparing it. And it's, here's a really great searchable, you know, index of all the CIDs that I'm onboarding of this data set. So my version of this thing that already exists is better because I'm also including, you know, this really good index of the data. So some other person knows how to go find the data set with the SPs, right? Like this is one of the things that we're seeing is just because a client puts that data online or just because that SP is retrievable. If another person said, well, I want to get a certain piece of this common crawler, a certain piece of this 3000 race genome, what's the most efficient way to go find the closest SP that has the best retrieval that has that one piece that you want to get. So how do we index this in a way that is really useful? And that would demonstrate again, like a much greater value add to the network and have a higher prioritization. So help us with this kind of, you know, solutions driven approach. If it falls to the governance team to have to come up with like all of these different standards, then we will usually err on the side of, you know, more limited, something that we have uh, tighter controls over um, because that's what we're going to have a better chance of being able to monitor and enforce with the manpower that we have, right? We have a lot of things on our roadmap and our prioritization. Um, and if we have to keep adding new places where we're owning all of the tooling or owning that standard, um, it's just splitting focus across these. So if the allocators themselves are able to say, great, we've come up with a really good standard way of knowing what are these public open data sets that clients are bringing to the network, which clients have already onboarded them, which ones are highly performant and retrievable, which ones are well indexed. And then when another client shows up and says, I have a copy of, you know, X, Y, and Z data set from some uh, large public repository, we can cross-reference that and say, yeah, this is new. This doesn't exist yet we will we will fast track this approval um and that will make that allocator again when we go to do these audits and compliance reviews for their data cap refresh if they say look here's eight clients we've worked with all of them have brought new data sets we can prove that because we built the bot that looks across all of these that, again that is adding more tooling and more value to the community that is going to increase your reputation that is going to increase um, the speed with which these things can get reviewed and approved so help us help you yeah great point thanks for adding that game um we got a dm from doris over at ipfs pt who would like to kind of present and talk for a few minutes so uh doris the floor is yours Yes. Hello. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, hi. hi. I, uh, I'm Joe and uh, hello, Kevin. Uh, hello, Kevin. Uh, and I'm a partner of F IPFSTT and Huilin Networks. I would like to give a brief overview of IPFSTT round two allocations. So in the last round, we made three commitments. And number one, uh, we, are, we will seek out for the support of corporate clients. And number two, we will strengthen our uh, due diligence on clients. Number three, we require clients work with retrievable SPs to ensure that their data can be successfully retrieved. So I'm pleased to tell you guys that we have fulfilled these promises. Uh, so regarding to the enterprise client, our uh, 10P was allocated to three clients, uh, one of which was an enterprise client, and we confirmed their identity uh, through the domain email addresses and forwarded the email to you for review. And as peace, this corporate client worked, will keep all unsealed files and did a good job with the data cap and retrieval. Regarding to the due diligence, uh, so we pay a lot of attention uh, to the review of the client. For this reason, we create additional survey forms uh, so the client 
uh, they need to fill out the form before we allocate the quota for them uh, before the allocation. And we will investigate the client's compliance in terms of disclose SP, data backup, uh, data retrieval, et cetera. So we are especially concerned about the client's retrieval. Uh, we, are, we are concerned also about whether Spark support SP. So, and we will also check the SP data in the real time by manually re retrieving it through the booth and Lassie, as well as by applying for the run retrieval test tools to retrieve it automatically. We would like to thank the Spark team for their help uh, in adding to the EMSPs that our clients work with the Spark backend, and now they all support Spark. The overall, we always follow the file plus rules uh, to avoid the wasting of time. Uh, we have provided more details uh, response on GitHub regarding to the details. And the last, uh, we are waiting to know when we will get the next 20p uh, be released to us. And, and I will stay in Dubai for a long time and hope to connect with everyone. Uh, thank you, guys. That's fabulous. Thank you for taking the time to, to kind of come on board. I'm screen sharing your refresh application now. So you'll see this one kind of move forward this week. And you're part of that same group that's been in the review process. So thanks for your patience. I see it here. So as long as those retrievals are in line, it'll be great. And we'll follow up with you and your ticket. Thanks again for that. I appreciate the time. Thank you. And then we had a chat come through from uh, Bing Zhao. The floor is yours if you'd like it. All right, maybe while we wait for them to kind of unmute, we will turn it over to Josh from non Tech. I see your hand. Or is yours if there's anything on your mind? Yeah, so we also uh, filed the uh, refilling for the Play Cap, but today I would like to talk about the uh, retrieval tools we are developing. So, uh, yeah, our communication with a lot of SPs, we find out that actually a lot of SPs are having difficult times adapting to the a retrieval method or Spark. They either use Venus system or they use the direct onboarding. And some of them have a very customized like uh, deal making system that they only support uh, next thing, not, not a smart gate retrieval or only support the boost retrieval. So uh, in our mind, if only uh, if the SP is storing public that is that, and uh, I agree that uh, public retrievability is very important, and the Spark is doing a very significant work uh, to ensure this. But we still believe that uh, we should uh, uh, diversify the methods for the retrievability. So, uh, in our opinion, if only the the, the the SPs can provide a method either is daughter's market or boost or any any command lines that can that could be publicly used then it is publicly retrievable so we are developing a tool that would uh, input that let the uh, SPs to customize the command to uh, to test the, the retrievability. So far, uh, our tools support both the daughter's market and the boost command. And uh, and maybe within this week or next, it will also support the NASI retrieval test as the Spark use. So, uh, so I hope this method can be accepted by the field path team. And also I'm looking for uh, support from you because so far we have difficulty connecting the data CID of the deals between a client and uh, an SP. So, so far, the method we are using now is after we allocating the uh, data, data cap to the clients, we and after the clients 
send the deals to the SPs, we ask the clients to upload a CSV file containing the data CIDs so that we can run the retrieval test. But this is obviously not automated way. So, so ideally we want we want to have a community API that if we put a client address and an SP address, it will like return the list of data CIDs between the client and the SP. In that way, our board can run almost uh, uh, completely automatically. Yeah, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Gosh, I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of outline this. Maybe I give you my initials and then Galen can kind of like add any points that I might drop off. So the first one is we hear you on the spark. And I just wanted to say thank you for kind of working through this. As you can imagine, a standard had to be set. And so spark was that. Now that being comes to data cap refresh and the audit is some organizations would send us a screenshot demonstrating their retrievability, but there was no verification and we could only see a small sampling size. If I'm hearing you correct, it sounds like you're working on tooling that can verify that retrieval that's not specific to Spark. Do I have that correct? Yes, uh, and if you go through our application for the refill, you can see that, uh, so you now for our newest uh, application, from a client. So every time the client uh, gets the data cap and sends the deals, we ask the client to submit a CSV file containing the containing the uh, data CIDs of the deals. And then we, so after some time to make sure that all of the deals are sealed, we would run, we would uh, send a message in our issue. It does check the trigger trigger the uh, retrieval test. And then in the in the trigger message, we provide the link to the CSV file. So the CSV file will be sent to our server to run the test. And then the bot will automatically run the retrieval test and uh, get back the result. Got it. Well, Josh, while I got you on the line, I've been following this one too. And if you could see my screen, you're looking at the watchdog yeah. comment that came through. And so we had these two examples that came back and there was zero retrieval on them. I know that you had posted a response on this one talking about the data set and then the four yeah, copies. Uh, so if you scroll, because this zero retrievability is from the, uh, the Spark result, but from our board result, because the, as, we communicated with the SPs in this application. They kind of only support boost and the daughter's retrieval. They do not support net yet. So in our backend, we are using the boost uh, command to run the test, retrieval test. So if you go to the issue, uh, no, I think it's issue 13 or issue 12, you can see the the conversation that they upload the CSV and after they upload the CSV, we run the, 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 the. So if you scroll down a little bit and more, more here. In, in the screenshot of the, yeah, and the screen, uh, scroll down more. And more, and more, and more, and more, and more. Yeah, so this is how we trigger our uh, test. So the, the my field 512 is our port count. So it will, for each SP, it will uh, randomly choose 20 CIDs and run the retrieval test. I see. Josh, this is great. Loving, loving this. Galen asked a question in chat, and I'll just say it here on the mic while you go through it. One of the things that needs to happen with any of these verifications of retrievals is that it can be open and auditable. So everything is transparent that takes place in the program. So 
two questions related to the bot. One, is there a repo that has the bot in it where the exports of this data will then land? So if anybody wanted to verify, say, the retrieval rating for a minor ID, they can go to that repo, they can load the bot, and they can see that themselves? Or is it only isolated on your end? Josh, I could see you on the call, but I see you're muted. So just to make sure you could hear that last question. Sorry, I I was talking to myself just now. So we will open source the repo very soon, as soon as we finish the last part for the nasty retrieval. And meanwhile, a good way to test it is that because uh, the allocate, our allocator repo has installed this bot. So if you just open a test issue and upload any DSV with some testing data uh, with any client, with any SP and CIDs, and anyone can trigger this, this report. Then Josh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop in Will Scott from Fiddle Team and Patrick who's been working with the Spark Retrieval. Because I think you're probably not alone with this. And if you're not the first, you're definitely not the last that sees this coming forward. The big things that we're just needing to take away, and maybe I'll just need to link it in this issue that we don't have, is so if we have this automated bot that's running it, triggers this, we should link this output file into this issue if it's not already. So it's not just the screenshot. And this makes it a lot easier for fast tracking yeah, to is. win the war. Yeah, it All right, is. so I'm, it is I'm in it right here. Issue. All right, this it's, is the one here, this compliance report. Josh, I don't know if you're muted. Were we in the right place again? Uh, so, you mean our test report should be included in the issue? Is that your question? Yeah, I think what I'd, I'd like to say that will help fast track this with some of the people is that when we come into this refresh application, we have the screenshot of this test trigger bot running. No, yeah, this this screenshot is exactly from our application issue of the client. So if we go to our annotator repo, find the issue, this, these are all public conversation. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that up on the back end so we don't keep everyone on the call, but I think it's valuable for them to hear and see. What we'll do is we'll link that here in this, this issue here, your repo, your bookkeeping that has that CID, that check that's going through, and we'll link it back. The big ones is just having like a real quick write up here on the bottom, like, hey, we spoke on the call. We have this repo. You can verify it here to see this. I'll take that right up, and I'm going to loop in Will and Patrick, and we're looking at it. Because what I want to do is separate two issues. Issue number one is making sure that we get you data cap refresh. We don't block you because you're not Spark retrievable. Issue number two is setting you up for success so that this tooling that you built that's open, that can be used and verifiable. So action item for you is if you can come through here and just link that MD file that you had, quick paragraph. I'm going to take that and plug in the guys on retrievable, and then that way we can kick that forward. Does that work for you? Josh, if you could hear me, I can't hear you. You might be muted again. So I'm going to follow up with you in the allocated it chat. Just that to make sure it seems that it will automatically boot me after a while. And I was just saying that in response to Gannon's question, uh, for example, could someone else trigger the bot on another client and a pair and get similar result? Yes. If only you, 
you upload a CSV containing the SP client and the data CID and uh, trigger the uh, port with the link to the CSV, it will run the uh, test on that client and SP pair. And, uh, yeah. and the second question is, can you link the report where your screenshot comes from? Uh, yeah, it is, and uh, let me post it real quickly. So it is just from the annotator report that we keep. Let me do this really quick. Annotator one, two, two, two. And issue. I think I found uh, like an example of the trigger run retrieval test. So this is what I'm saying is we, you know, we need other people to be able to review and verify this um, and kind of verify the CSV. Like it seems like the clients are submitting the CSV file. So how does that mm -hmm. CSV get verified um, that the client is actually the owner of it? Uh, so this is where, you know, there you, you can understand there are ways that this could be gamed. Right. So if the client yeah, okay. is the one uh, owning yeah. the CSV, they could put whatever they want in that CSV file. Yeah, um, so that's so, why Yeah, so that's why we want the community tool that to get out to magni for the CIDs of that uh, client and SP pair so that the client will not be able to falsify the CSV file. Right, which is again like why we've been using, you know, the current thing that exists uh, through yeah, okay. Spark. So as you know, this is good. Keep developing this and get it to a point where, you know, it's something that can be verified and audited by other people in the community. Because as I look at it right now, there's just a couple, you know, gut flags that you know give me concern because i you know i'm not going to be able to open every csv and then go compare the csv that the client provided with some other set of you know audit like data cap stats to look at well did the client put everything in the csv that should be there and then it's also the question of, well, what is the bot, the MyFill 512, what is it actually doing with that CSV? So where can we go to see? And, you know, people need to be able to look at, well, how is the MyFill 512 bot, what is it doing to this CSV file, right? Is it mm -hmm. taking everything in the CSV file and doing a boost? Like you gave a voiceover right now but someone else needs to be able to like look at that code and kind of audit that code, right? So this is where we need, we want to see this kind of development, but it has to come with, you know, more documentation, more review. What is the, yeah, okay. what's working right now? What's in development? And that's where we need you know, we need to make this available. So what I would like to see is, you know, if you could put together some of that documentation and send it to us and send it to the other allocators to review as well, then other allocators could test this too. Because like we've said, the Spark protocol, that standard is just one possible way, but it is the current most uh, most developed but if we get another one that works for a different type of retrieval testing, then that would be great. But we need to verify, you know, how it is built. What is the logic? What is, who's maintaining it? How are these things getting done? Because the thing that we saw in the past is SPs would just whitelist requests from one specific bot and the data wouldn't actually be retrievable by anyone else in the community. It would just appear to be retrievable because they whitelisted that one 
bot, right? So that doesn't meet the requirement. So there's all these kind of caveats and that's why just doing, you know, just having a, a screenshot or just saying, well, it works when I do it is not the same as saying, well, it works when this other independent standard is able to review it. So give us some more information, you know, give us a, a repo where we can review it. Give us some examples, go ask other clients to put together the same CSV or go put that CSV together for some other clients that aren't using your pathway. And let's test it there as well. Let's cross-reference this data with Spark data, you know, demonstrate to us that this is a accurate way to test retrieval. Um, and we would love to have other options. Yeah, I can totally understand your concern. So the well, the first concern is about uh, the CSV file, the client app node. For this, I, yeah, that's why I'm uh, speaking to you. I'm searching for community therapy because for us, it, it's not realistic to keep track of all the uh, data CIDs between every client and SP pair. So it will cost us a lot of server and the storage. And for the second concern about the code, we will open source it very soon and we will uh, give a manual on how to run the bot server and how to install it to the annotated repo so everyone can test it. Yeah, I mean, Data Cap Stats has the ability to download CSV data. So go see what you can download because it, it might be possible that you just use what is available in that data lake and cross-reference what a client gives you or run the bot against that download from data cap stats because that is a service that is, you know, watching and ingesting chain interactions. So it could be something that the bot filters out from that download and then you don't have to reinvent that part of it and you could either ask the client but then go compare what the client gives you um, or you could skip asking the client if you're able to get what you need from the data cap stats entirely so i think there there are ways to uh solve this problem and make it not um, not something that that would require everyone to, you know, manually review a CSV file for accuracy. Okay, that's great. So, Josh, just to kind of close the loop on that, awesome. Thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start a thread in our allocator Slack, and then that way we can kind of fast track it and make sure that this conversation carries forward. So thanks again for okay, thank you. that. We'll say uh, one last call before we, we wrap. If there's anything on your minds, the floor is yours. Welcome to the second allocator governance call taking place on July 23rd. Same agenda as the first. Let's take a quick deep dive. Quick, we'll check in on what took place at the Dev Summit last week in Brussels, some highlights from the program talks that happened, as well as share some links that might be helpful for videos for you to check out. Second is we will be circling back the final on the data cap refresh, checking in on the 12 allocator organizations that are waiting on that, so that will all clear. And then we'll check in on applying. So if you would like to become an allocator or reapply for an allocator, we'll go over that project. And we'll end with a check-in on common crawl data and what we're seeing as far as duplications go. So again, this is the second call of July 23rd. Next call is scheduled to take place on August 6th. And if you're keen for any of this information, all these slides are in Slack. I'll drop these here in chat too. So if you want the deck or the slides or anything we talk about, it's right here as we go. Just to check in on metrics. So month over month, we've seen 29 new client applications processed, which resulted in 54 petabytes of data onboarded to the network. And we saw four new allocators turn on and start processing that. So great work and thank you for all that you do. All right. Hey, Dev Summit. So last week was the Filecoin Dev Summit that took place out in Brussels. And rather than having scheduled tracks, 
there was more of an open format to this session. So it wasn't live, but there's a lot of calls that took place. And we'll talk about that as we go through for the recording. But there were three things that came from that that the team wanted to make sure that was highlighted for your awareness. One was exploring the option for a test net. And what this test net would do is allow for the experimentation of different subsidies on chain to see how that would handle it. So look forward in the coming weeks and months for teams that are working on that test net and trying to make that whole process a little bit more smooth and come up with some new workarounds for how to make that a better process for everybody. The second was looking at how we can use smart contracts or tooling that automates a lot of the process. For those of you that have been in the Filecoin ecosystem for a while, one of the main grievances that we've heard is that there's too much human interaction in a decentralized platform. And that's great feedback. And how can we take the humans out of that? So that was a big talk topic of looking at automated diligence, automated reportings, dashboards, whatever we can do to make this process completely automated would be kind of the way that we should be moving forward on that. And the third was looking at like, where does the business development come from? Is it the storage providers? Is it the clients? Who's doing this outreach and how are those people supported in that? So with that, a lot of the talk tracks that you'll see on YouTube kind of hit a lot of those points. So in this slide, you'll see the links for all the talks. This top one here has all the videos of the summit. I think that there's about 30 or 40 of them. So if you wanted to just spend two days on YouTube, feel free to watch all of these. If your time is money and you're busy like the rest of us, here's three that I recommend checking out. They're all about 10 or 15 minutes. And these are just the highlights for program talks that really dealt with Filecoin Plus. So the first ones here are Lessons on Running an Allocator by KZ. Great talk. So KZ is part of Fiddle. They put together essentially an enterprise pathway. They put together a lot of the tooling. And he's just kind of tip of the spear has seen a lot of the issues that you might encounter as well. So you can pull from his lessons learned in that talk. Great session. Highly recommend you check it out. The second is Spark Protocol by Patrick Woodhead. And Patrick one is one of the lead developers on Spark. Great session talking about how that Spark retrieval is working, where they see that going in the future. I know that there's been a lot of questions about having data retrievable in Spark. So if you were curious just to watch a quick 15 minute from the lead developer on that, great session talk. And the third is from Will dealing with smart contracts, that automation that we talked about. Will, just brilliant of a man. And he gives a great 15 minute session talking about what kind of tooling can be stood up from Fiddle or the community that would enable these smart contracts to work more effectively so that there's less humans in the loop and it's just more of an automated system. So three great talks if you're keen to watch them, good sessions as we go through it. All right, data cap refresh, and why I imagine a few of you are here on the call tonight. So there is essentially 28 allocator organizations that have distributed their five petabytes so far. Of those 28, so far we've processed as is seven. So these are organizations that were fully compliant, doing what they should, everything was documented, data cap refresh went out. There were five that were conditionally approved, which means for whatever reason, their retrieval rates were at zero or climbing, or they didn't have very clear bookkeeping, but they were working on it. They were awarded a partial refresh, about half of the data cap, with the expectation that they would fix those issues before receiving more. And there were four organizations that were not renewed either because there was no repos, there was no KYC, the data cap was just distributed without a schedule. And so those were denied outright. And those organizations, if they would like to remain in the Filecoin program, have to reapply. And then there's 12 that have been in review for a while. I'd like to thank you for your patience on the 12 that have been in review. One of the things that was really tricky about the data cap refresh for all organizations was really defining what the standards were for looking at this. So if we held allocator one to a standard, does allocator two get held to the same standard if they're doing different things? So that was tricky to figure out. I think it's done and you should see that process right now. So I'd like to kind of highlight on that. These are the applications that you'll see updated if not already, I'll check after this call, they'll be in tomorrow. And these organizations, 1475, EF, Genesis, Non-Entropy, ByteBase, VSTAR, and Alpha, ND Labs, Meta Era, Data Preservation, Fiddle, Hash Teams, and Heong Network. So these organizations had self-filed for their refresh, went through, and a lot of comments back and forth. 
So I'd like to thank all the organizations that leave comments in the issues. It makes it really easy when it's all in one thread in that GitHub. That way, all the Spark team can look at it, all of the diligence can look at it, and it's all in one place. I'd like to show what the big things that the retrieval is looking at for any data cap refresh. Number one, it's verifying that there was some type of bookkeeping that was put in place so that the client that was asking for the data, you have a very clear record of who they are, what the data is. If that's not there, that's a big flag and that will either block or prevent the data cap going out. Verifying the SPs. So if you say you're gonna work with these four SPs and you didn't work with those four SPs, there needs to be a very clear indication on why that was the case. And same thing with the distribution schedule. If you say that a small amount's gonna go out at first and then progressively get larger, and it doesn't fit that mold, that takes additional requirement to look at what was going on with that and why. So if you address that in those GitHub issues, it makes it a lot faster. And I think the fourth one that everyone is trying to figure out and do eloquently is the verified retrievability. So a lot of questions about if I'm not using Spark and I'm using my own retrievability, how do I demonstrate that, whether it's a CSV file or a repo and sharing that? So thank you for those organizations that commented on that, makes it a lot easier. And then to kind of echo this, thanks for the patience. This has been cleared. And if you haven't seen that comment come through from Galen already, that'll be landing any moment now as we go through. So I know that there was a few of you on the line that have asked about this. And again, apologies while we waited for this to all process, but any questions on the data cap refresh from anyone on the line? All right. If you are on the line right now, and for whatever reason, you were not renewed for data cap, and you would like to reapply, retool, and come back, I wanted to check in. So essentially, what we have right now is a way for automated applying to the Filecoin allocator system. This is very different. As you know, it used to be an election where you had to wait a year. Now you can apply at any time. The caveat that I'd like you to be aware of is what you see here in red. It's the manual pathways will be processed below data cap refresh paperwork and new pathways resulting in longer review times. So this means that right now in the program, we have about 87 manual allocators that are processing these applications that come through and onboarding data, 47 of them. So what that means is that every new manual allocator that we bring on board really isn't moving the needle on the program because we have 47 that are across the world that can handle these applications. So there was an RFA that was sent out about two months ago. RFA stands for Request for Allocator. And what we're really looking for are allocators that can do something new or novel or really help the program versus just having this manual allocators go from 47 to 51, which really doesn't change much. So we're looking for allocators that have some type of automated system. So like Glyph had the GitHub where you could request 32 gigs. We're looking for any allocator that wants to set something similar up, a GitHub, a social tool, staked backing of fill, or an allocator that wants to create a market-based system with fees or auctions or proof of payment, or something experimental where you're doing something review or anonymous, something outside of the box. So what this means kind of coming back is that if you were an allocator, and you did not get a data cap refresh, and you have submitted a new application, I just want to kind of forward warn you that post-nucleation, post-bandwidth, it will not be as quick of a process to onboard you into the program and get your multi-sig and get all the diligence put onto it. We're de-scoping that in favor of really prioritizing for the data cap refresh and new allocators that come on board. So again, if you were an allocator that reapplied, it will be a lengthy wait while we get that all set up to get anybody back into the program at a reduced data cap. So I wanted to pause and see if that impacts anyone on the call and if you have any questions about reapplying or applying for the first time. All right then. Let's check in on duplication of public data sets. So here's what we've started to see. A lot of great 
great data sets out there in the public domain, Common Crawl, and a lot of those have started to be onboarding on the Filecoin network, if not already. What we started to see is with these open data sets, we're seeing duplication that riles into like the 30s, which means that there's 30 copies of one data set that's stored duplicative over the network. And what that really does is doesn't add value, which is one of the main drivers of the Filecoin Plus system, is that you could onboard that data. But for the 10x multiplier, what we're really working to is like very high quality data that's coming onto the network. So there's going to be a proposal that's filed. This is the first we're talking about it to say, look, when does it stop making sense to back up the same data? So what we're going to be looking at in this proposal is after 10 replicas of a single data source, does it make sense to no longer authorize the multiplier on a data set that's been duplicated 10 times over the network? Now, this would leave the door open if for whatever reason there was some demonstration where this data was high value and you could make the case. But I wanted to kind of prep you for this discussion that's coming in proposals is saying after a replica of a common data set has been introduced after 10 times, do we cut the multiplier for that for the data coming forward? So this is the first we're talking of this topic. I wanted to get any feedback you might have before this goes to a GitHub proposal in the coming days. So floor is yours if you have any thoughts pro or against or on topic. All right, this might be a real quick call hi, when it's hi. through these. Yeah, floor is yours, but on the reducing or multiply effect, maybe the same copy if they are in dif different regions or location locality, then maybe there's no need to reduce the multiply effect. Maybe locality should be taken into consideration as well. Yeah, that's such a great point, Kenneth, and I think you're spot on. And I agree with you. It. It 100% makes sense to me if you have that one copy or two copies or a few copies in one region to expand it. So like, yeah, hey, I've got a storage provider who's based in South America. They're now going to store this copy versus, hey, we're in Europe and we already have 15 copies of this. But I think you're spot on with looking at the regional. And I think that that'll be one of the qualifiers that we put in that. So great point. Batman, I see your question about the uh, initiative on the test nets. You know, I wasn't at that dev summit. I know that Reba, former PL, is just brilliant with these things, and he was looking into that. Let me ask Will and Galen, who were at the event, who is specifically was looking into that, and I'll post in the Slack thread. I'll tag them, and I'll tag you. So I'll take action to find out about the test net. I'll bug it here, and I'll post in Slack on who's running that. If you have any more questions, I think right now it's still like in the idea phase, but if there's a roadmap or something, they would know and they can link it back. Got it. All right. Well, if I left you with two points, here they are. It's one to these organizations that have been incredibly patient while we've standardized this review. Thank you for your time. You'll see this go in. And two, if you've been working with open public data sets for a while and onboarding these, be mindfully ready that there will be a proposal that's going to come out about having no more than 10 copies for like specific regions. And if you have thoughts on this or you've been ingesting common crawl data, really like to get your feedback when that proposal, and I'll link it in the Slack as well, because I'd like to know what we're doing for you. Other than that, again, open forum for anything that might be on your mind. The floor is yours.